The eagle has landed only right on Seattle's James Paxton. We keep talking about all this rain, but it's giving us some beautiful shots like this on the Palouse. I'll tell you when we can see a break in the wet weather. Get down right now! Get down right now! It was an officer-involved shooting, and nearly a year later, we get the officer's first-hand look at all the chaos. Welcome everyone. It's good to have you with us. I'm Jane McCarthy and I'm Mark Hanrahan. We are tracking some breaking news tonight. Spokane police confirm a body has been found at the Spokane Waste to Energy facility. Right now we know the Spokane County Medical Examiner and Spokane Police Major Crimes Unit are on scene investigating. Crem 2's Evan Narani is there gathering the latest information for us tonight. Evan. Yeah, Jane and Mark, right now uh, we're on the scene. This is on the 2900 block of West Geiger at the Spokane uh, Waste and Energy site. Uh, I'll give you a look at what we're seeing right now. There is not much activity that we're able to get close to because it is blocked off to the public right now. But what the police are confirming is that a dead body was found in the trash uh, at this site. They confirm it was not the body of uh, anyone who worked at the site. It was not an employee and it was also not a result of an industrial accident. Uh, they're not giving much more information beyond that. Obviously, this call came in uh, just recently. It came in just after the three o'clock hour. So we're still developing those details uh, as they come. So for now, I'll throw it back to you in the studio. I'm Evan Narani, Crime 2 News. Evan, thank you very much. We'll keep you posted as we get updates. All right, to weather now, if you like dreary, wet weather, well, you're in luck. Well, that is a gorgeous <laughs> picture in some ways, right, Tom? Tom, how long is the rain going to keep well, sticking around? Because it's not stopping. Yeah, it's not stopping, uh, although to, by tomorrow midday, I think it does stop for a little bit of time. By Saturday, it shows up. Here's the deal. You wanted a trip to the west side, wanted to go over to the Seattle area. What have I done for you? You get to staycation. You, you get to stay here at home. You don't get to uh, waste the gas money, uh, the time in the car. <laughs> You get Seattle weather right here and also temperatures will warm up. We've got a lot of subtropical moisture streaming into the West Coast right now, everywhere from Northern California up to Washington State. Widespread rain across the Spokane area. This will continue overnight and then decrease on Friday before another bigger weather system begins to move in. We'll see an overnight low of 37 degrees. Wind out of the east at 5 to 10 miles an hour for your Friday. We'll look for again morning rain, a little bit of clearing in the afternoon should peak out. Uh, uh, at about 50 degrees and we'll see that sunrise at 19 minutes after six o'clock. I always look ahead to the weekend. We've got temperatures in the low to mid 50s. The uh, windiest and rainiest day will be on Saturday and then we'll begin to see some drying out by Sunday afternoon with a high of 55. I'll have a look at your 10 day forecast coming up in a few minutes. Thank you, Tom. In other news, police say he was a danger to himself and others when they shot a man in the Perry District nearly a year ago. That man survived and he's still in the Spokane County Jail, charged with multiple counts of assault. Well, today, Spokane police released body camera footage of that incident. Krem 2's Lindsay Nadrich joins us now with more on what happened. Lindsay? Well, today we learned this whole thing started at Holy Family Hospital. That explains why witnesses say he was wearing a hospital gown before the confrontation with police. Officers say the suspect, Terrence Willette, has a history of threatening others and hurting himself with a knife. Police say Terrence Willette checked himself into the emergency room at Holy Family, complaining of a possible overdose of his ADD medication. Surveillance video shows Willette refusing to open the door to his hospital room. Staff say he then pulled out a knife, saying he wanted to leave. He then ran out of the hospital, got into his car, and took off. Police say the hospital didn't notify them of what happened there, though. They didn't get involved until someone called in a reckless driver in northeast Spokane. Witnesses say Willette jumped out of his car while it was still running in a neighborhood. One man in that neighborhood said Willette chased him and his kids with a knife. Another neighbor shot this cell phone video. It shows Willette yelling at officers. Body camera video released today shows another perspective. Get down right now! Get down right now! Please stop! As you heard in the video, one officer deployed a taser, but it was ineffective. Officers say Willette slit his own wrist and stabbed himself before threatening police with a knife. Three officers fired their weapons, hitting Willette several times. He survived and is currently in jail. 
So police say this isn't the first time Willette has threatened others and himself with a knife. In November of 2012, police took Willette to the hospital after he stabbed himself twice with a knife and asked police to shoot him. In April of 2013, he held a knife to the throat of a woman who had a restraining order against him and again fought with police. Then in October of 2014, police say Willette armed himself with a knife during a standoff situation and threatened to stab officers and a police canine. Willette is a seven time convicted felon. In studio, I'm Lindsay Nadrich, Crem2 News. Lindsay, thank you very much. Bad weather was stalling crews efforts to find the last three children of the Hart family. Authorities believe their mothers intentionally drove off a cliff in California last week. The bodies of the mothers and three of their children have been recovered, but still no sign of the other three children. Searchers are looking for any sign of them. The family moved to Southwest Washington from Oregon recently. The couple faced abuse allegations in both states. Oregon's Department of Human Services has come under fire for not notifying Washington officials about the family's child welfare issues. These lives must end and they must end now. That is Idaho Representative Raul Labrador and he is disputing claims by a political action committee that he's accomplished nothing during his time in Congress. The Idaho First PAC is currently running an ad that claims Labrador has sponsored zero bills that have become law. Labrador, who is running for governor, says he authored and sponsored three bills that became law, two of which he ultimately voted against in 2014 because they were included in a larger bill that he opposed. Over the past few days, we have aired our first round of Krem election interviews. You sent us the topics and questions important to you, and then our reporter Rob Harris posed those questions to candidates for Washington's 5th Congressional District seat. All three candidates for Washington's 5th Congressional District, Kathy McMorris-Rogers, Lisa Brown, and Jared Gavin Bonet, received many questions over our Facebook and Twitter pages, but one topic was top of mind. When I asked for your questions for the candidates on Facebook and Twitter, the topic of immigration came up again and again for all three candidates. It also came up on President Trump's Twitter at the beginning of the week. He seemed to shut the door on protections for dreamers, declaring in a tweet that DACA is dead. But Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers told me last week that she's still committed to a DACA fix and her office reaffirmed this position after the president's tweets. My biggest disappointment in the, the budget deal was the fact that we did not get a DACA fix uh, as a part of that deal. It was, uh, it's overdue. Congress was supposed to get this done by March 5th. Uh, I am working right now actively with my colleagues on legislation on uh, what, I, what I believe would be a way to both ensure that we have the border security that the administration is calling for, as well as the DACA fix. And I think a three-year fix makes sense, that we would get three years of border security and a three-year DACA fix and give those um, DACA kids the certainty that I hear is forefront on their minds. Kids that are in universities and colleges right here in Eastern Washington that don't know what their future is. And we need to, we need to give them some certainty. Another main source of controversy within the immigration debate so-called sanctuary cities for illegal immigrants. Republican candidate Jared Gavin Bonet is against them, but he wants to see immigration reform to make legal immigration easier. I do not agree with sanctuary cities. Um, we've seen an epic fail in that system. The legal immigrant that murdered Kate in California, you know, he was in a sanctuary city um, and he got, he got off with time served. And when it comes to Immigration, I think that we need immigration reform. Um, I have friends that uh, are immigrants. When they came here, they came here legally, they followed all the proper channels, and they had, it took them about five years and thousands of dollars to attain citizenship. You know, we need to find a way that we can vet these people, get them in here faster, and make it easier for them if they want to come here legally. Democratic candidate Lisa Brown was also asked about sanctuary cities. She told me she doesn't want the federal government to interfere in decisions made by local law enforcement agencies. Here in Spokane, the mayor, the city council, the sheriff, and local law enforcement are all on the same page. So they've set a priority for how to use our local law enforcement resources and I support that. The federal government has a role when it comes to 
uh, illegal immigration, but local government resources, our taxpayer dollars, I believe are being appropriately utilized. I think we've got agreement here and there's no reason for the federal government to come in and interfere with the policies we've put in place. So, our first round of Kremlin elections interviews may be over, but the election season, it's just beginning. And we want to keep covering the issues and the questions that are important to you. So message me on Facebook, send me a tweet with the hashtag Krem Elections, and let me know what you want to hear. In the studio, Rob Harris, back to you.